Welcome to No More Rules, the impact of being you no matter what. A movement to awaken your inner power and be the creator of your own healthy life with hosts Steph Yost and Camille Barreto, where clean eating is at the core of our inner growth by honoring our body and health. They will help shift perceptions, encourage thinking outside the box, and overcoming limiting behaviors and beliefs. You are worthy of living your best life, developing your inner power with clean eating and healthy lifestyle, and discovering your awesomeness. No More Rules starts now. Hi, I'm Stephanie, and this is Camille with No More Rules, and we are really excited today to have Meredith Willits off with Meredith with a Y podcast on, and everything Meredith does. I, <laughs> I hope some of you are aware of her because she's fantastic, and I feel really blessed to have met her several months ago at a little winery in Sioux City, um, South Dakota. And I love yeah, Iowa. Yes. And when <laughs> I met her and I saw her in the room, I thought, oh, I have to meet this woman. There's something amazing about her. And then when she said what she does and all this, and I could tell that I was just drawn to her. So I immediately went and found her podcast and website and everything Meredith and have listened to every episode, most of them several times and have been telling our clients and Camille and mm -hmm. so many people about you. And I just... I feel truly blessed to have met you that day because I just, everything I've listened to and everything you talk about resonates so much with what we talk about on No More Rules and with our clients about honoring yourself and having boundaries and being authentic. And that's what, that's what you're all about. So I want to say welcome and thank you for joining us today. So tell us a little bit about you and what you do. Well, first, I want to thank both of you, Camille, Stephanie, for having me here today. I'm so honored to be a part of this program and that you see me. And that means so much to all humans to be seen. And so I appreciate that. Um, and I appreciate you inviting me on so we can have this great conversation and hopefully lead the your listeners to a happier, happier and healthier place. So, um, So thank you very much. So a little bit about me. Um, I basically started on this journey about, I would say, 15 or so years ago. And oddly, it started with a blog. And I believe when looking back in hindsight that that blog was, to me, something to do as a stay-at-home mom with small children. Um, but it actually was a huge part in beginning my healing process to be the person that I am today. We don't even realize sometimes how valuable um, it is to express ourselves and feel safe to express ourselves and have a place to express ourselves and I think I really, as we say in 2023, unpacked a lot in 20, 2010 and such. Um, so that's kind of how this all began, if you will. Um, also, I want to mention um, that it also began with a really healthy marriage, a really safe space to start to do the work. And I, at the time, didn't even realize that that was what's happening, but able you know, now to look back that safe space to be Meredith and whatever that meant and whatever that means on the daily and moving forward um, is I think imperative to all things healthy. You know, if we're nervous or we're anxious or we're embarrassed or shamed, um, that self-worth is not going to grow and self-worth and self-esteem, I believe is what carries you through um, healing the trauma and and being good to your body and um, a space to do the work. So, you know, that's kind of how it all started. And over the past 15 years, starting with that blog, um, I then started getting into energy work, um, emotional release work, which is like the emotion code and the body code by Dr. Bradley Nelson. Um, and then that started to transform into mediumship work. You know, nothing is created, nothing is destroyed. We're eternal beings, um, which then turned into psychic work and life coaching. So I've realized that through the intuition and the strong intuition and the psychic work um, and life coaching classes that I could really meld all of it together to really bring my clients huge transformations. I always say, 
an hour with me is like 10 years of therapy because I just, I can find you really fast and I can find where the problem is coming from very, very quickly where you might not even know that it's coming from, be it a past life or trauma age three. Those are the little nuances that I can find by way of the energy work and then compounding that with, you know, more of the traditional, if you will, life coaching um, as well. So, and that, of course, of my husband used to say, like, you got to talk to people and they have, you know, one of seven problems, right? And so that started to transform into the podcast because I was seeing that a lot of people had the same struggles that were coming from a lot of the same places. So I'm like, hey, this is a great place. A lot of people can't afford me. And so I can send them to my podcast for free. Um, and I can help way more people uh, that maybe can't afford it or don't, don't have the time for coaching. So that's kind of how I got to where I met today. And then I wrote a book because I'm like, hey, $14.99 on Amazon and it's got some really powerful stuff in it. So that's kind of where I'm sitting right now is coaching and podcasting and trying to write books and all that fun stuff. I love that. And I love that you brought up your husband. Um because a lot of my journey, I wasn't in such a great marriage at one time in my life. And even last night, Meredith, like I said, I'm super tired. We were just laying watching a show and I had my head just resting on my new husband. I've been with him seven years on his lap and he's just rubbing my head. And this, this appreciation and gratitude came over me that he accepts you and loves you a hundred percent as you are. There is no safer place to be than with your husband where it wasn't at all. I could completely, I love that you said that was a huge part of my healing because I think even Steph would say after I met my current husband, I heal that you've got to be in a safe environment where you're fully accepted and loved because he goes, if I didn't know any better, I would think you had a personality disorder because who you were when we met and who you are now you're not even a right. And 100%. I'm like, really? the most beautiful answer I said, and how do you feel about that? And he goes, doesn't matter how I feel about it. I have a healthier, happier wife. Yeah. I was actually thinking I about that recently with regard to a friend um, situation that I've been dealing with and recognizing the shift in my energy when I'm not around that person. And also even some, some extended family, like there's a reason I'm not calling you is because I don't feel safe. I feel attacked. I feel defensive. And although I can isolate and silo myself and be understanding that their energy is theirs and my energy is mine, it doesn't mean I have to co-mesh with them on the daily. And so really protecting your peace has been something 2023 that I've been really focusing on is seeing where I am not peaceful and understanding how that not only affects my health, my mental health, my children, um, my business, and and seeing where the hiccups are coming from, seeing where that jarring. And it's so funny that you said that you were thinking that last night, because I went to bed last night, and I was having so much gratitude for my husband um, that he fully, it must have been in the air last night, right? He was just, was. I felt fully accepted as I was like going up to bed to wash my face. And I was like, I can't believe how this feels because for decades, I felt so defensive. And I mean, the first three years of our marriage, he must have said a thousand times, I'm not against you. My family's not against you. I'm on your team. And I actually tell clients that over and over again, when they are dealing with somebody who has like avoidant or anxious uh, personality disorder, because they are literally living in fight or flight based on their childhood or relationships. And they need you to kind of show up and remind them, I'm on your team. I'm on your team. And I will tell clients all the time, like, I don't know how to deal with my husband. Like he retreats or he's anxious or whatever. And I'm like, just keep reminding them that you're on their team and just say it over and over again. And, and, and it does make a huge difference to be reminded of it when you do grow up in a very fight or flight um, environment. Yeah. Those are really, really good words to remember. I'm on your team. Yeah. Mm -hmm recently read somewhere of to ask people, how can I support you? Those type of things instead yeah. of always coming up with a solution, like 
I'm sad, I'm upset, I'm having problems with this. And sometimes we're just vomiting solutions to everybody instead yeah. of going, I'm on your team and how can I support you? Years ago, when Camille would come into the office in the morning and I'd hear her click down the hall and I'd be like, good morning, Camille. And I'd hear, good morning, in this high pitch voice. And I'd be like, oh, she's not settled. Until, yes. and her voice was really high, until you had come in and got grounded for the day. And I think those were going on when you were still in the process of your horrible divorce and a lot of other things. I could even just tell in her voice that she wasn't settled yet. And until until you, I'd had you let you have your time to settle in, then I'd be like, let's start our day together. But it's like to recognize and say, I'm on your team yeah. and let everybody figure that out of where they're at. Yes. And it's like, I have to do that too. It's like, okay, bring yourself down because I'm super energetic and not everybody needs it. Yeah. I, I tell people all the time, the beginning to a really transformed relationship, especially with adult children or teenage adult children, or even your spouse is when they bring something to you, get in the habit of saying, are you venting? Or are you asking for advice in my opinion? Because that allows the invitation for them to make that choice. And as soon as they say, I'm asking for your opinion, you then we began a conversation. But if you sure. jump on your kids and try to fix everything or your spouse, they feel annihilated. It's overwhelming. And usually they're not even listening. But if they say, no, I want to hear your opinion, boom, you've now started. And I will tell you with my adult children, this is a game changer, an absolute game changer, because now they bring me stuff all the time because they know I'm not going to pounce. So yeah. Huge making that safe space and I think the thing and I'm so excited because in our next um, segment we're going to talk about self-sabotage and survival and I think you know we've done it differently Meredith but I've probably experienced a lot of that same stuff I just was never good enough and we talked about that when we were kind of talking about the show so you never know who to feel safe around but I would say the most healing thing for both me and my son he's now 16 so I love your advice on that I said was there anything pivotal in in your healing journey and he said time mm. time was the most pivotal the consistency that people show up consistently with me around me that was the most healing thing that I could have had at the time probably yeah yeah. And we what, basically what you're saying is I'm on your team, you know, I'm on your team every time you show up. Yeah. yeah. And you're like, I'm here for you in whatever way you need. And when you need it, you just let me know. Yeah. Um, at that point, we've got to take a quick little break. So we're with no more rules with Stephanie and Camille, and this is Meredith. So hang on and we'll be right back. Everybody, we're back with no more rules. This is Camille and I'm Steph and we're with Meredith today and we are so excited to have this great guest and just having this great conversation even offline. So let's jump into it right away. We're talking about uh, self-sabotage of everybody does it in so many different facets of our life and we think of Neil and I being health coaches and with our weight loss program is people sabotage themselves over and over and they're only hurting themselves, but it's such a process. And when we were visiting with Meredith the other day, she had great words that just really resonated with us. So tell us your take on self that sabotage. So it actually, I was watching a video and they articulated it so beautifully that it made it clear to me, although I've seen it in the past in my mind's eye of how self-sabotage works. Um, so when we're literal, little, uh, we are very easily programmed to what is safe and what is not safe. And inherently from basically the day that we are born, we are who we are. And as we heal, basically what we're doing is we're undoing all the damage that has been done to us, right? So that is actually what is healing is undoing. And so um, when I look at self-sabotage, what it actually is, is you are a person that through the programming of church, school, family, friends, the schoolyard, you have been programmed to feel not safe being you. It's not safe to be a boy and take ballet. It's not safe to be a girl and have pigtails. You're going to be made fun of or be overweight or whatever it is that is inherently you with all the information around you, you're told it's not safe. So 
you then move forward in life and do what we call self-sabotaging. So um, you do things to hurt yourself. In the greatest, most extreme fo form of this, it would be taking your own life. If you were to look at a less extreme but still uh, destructive, it can be addiction, be it food addiction or drug addiction, alcohol addiction. And so what you're doing in those uh, realms with those those tools of addiction um, or taking your life is you are recognizing that I cannot be me. So instead of being me, I'm going to quiet me. I'm going to turn all of me off by indulging in 13 bags of potato chips or, um, uh, you know, hurting myself with too much booze or worse. And so in other ways, we might not follow our life path because it's not safe to be who I am. And I want to be a beautician, but everyone's telling me that I have to go to a four-year college. So I'm going to self-sabotage and not be the beautician and not be happy, but what you're really doing is you're trying to survive in a world that tells you that being you is not okay, okay? And so when we have the awakening, what we're actually doing is we're waking up to the programming, we're waking up to the lies that our society that says you are not okay to be you, and we go, oh, I'm not doing this anymore. I don't yeah. need to quiet who I am. I don't need to check out by disassociating into a bottle of wine every single night or whatever the thing is. Because what you're doing is, is you're quieting the spirit. Ooh. You're shutting who you are down so that it would just shut up already. I'm just going to fake it till I make it. I'm just going to be this pretend person that everyone tells me I, I can be. But the problem is, is who you are can never be hidden. It will show up whether you're 60, whether you're 80, whether you're 90. And, you know, you see this in people who are like 80 years old and get a divorce. And you're like, they're 80. They're going, <laughs> they've got like two years left. And they say, I just can't do it anymore. I just can't do it. We see it in women who are 50, who get a divorce, their kids finally go away and move out of the house and they reinvent themselves. That is where you see, well, why did you self-sabotage all those years? I wasn't self-sabotaging. I was surviving. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And even just putting that statement out there, because there will be clients um, sitting in our office and they'll almost get upset with themselves when it's revealed to them that they are self-sabotaging because I'm all about, and I don't know how you feel about it, but I had to learn to lighten up and understand, like, we're just here having a bunch of experiences. We're learning every day. So why are we taking this all so seriously? So when yeah. you come in, like, I want to hear the self-sabotaging stories because you're just going to perpetually repeat that cycle until we talk about it. And then they feel comfortable because I'm not judging, I'm not criticizing, but they'll say, Camille, where along the way, why did I, and I will just say to them, that was how you were surviving, darling. Yeah. So go easy on yourself. Don't hate yourself for doing that. That was the way that you learned how to survive. And even I'm sure the word empath is big to you. Like I read people great too, but when I was a child, you probably hear that all the time. A lot of people have to learn how to read the room, right? Yep. And know what's going on. So they become experts as a child at reading behaviors and, and knowing all of that. But that was the way I was going to survive emotionally. Yeah. I didn't learn that. Like how you're supposed to behave in this certain group, like read the room. So you mean yeah, like, or this group expects me to be this Stephanie wearing this hat. And or my dad, was he Jekyll or was oh, he hot okay. when he came home? And so I was great at what's, what's his mood? Because yeah. I want to make sure dad's happy. I don't want to upset the whole, and you hear that over and over with a lot of our clients. So you saying survival, absolutely. That's what it is a lot of times. Yeah. And you hear it in, in the onion and you hear it in the food space so much, right? Like Oh, um, I have yeah. a friend who struggles with weight and it's, I ate good today. I was good. 
I ate bad today. Um, so it's really like, a you could hear it in the language even. Yeah. And so when we're eating and we know we're eating bad, right? What is that? That is self-punishment due to some sort of underlying low self-worth where you are self-punishing. So you could equate the food to cutting, to getting drunk, to whatever other destructive behavior because you feel you deserve that punishment of self. And they've proven that 80% of our serotonin lives in our gut, right? Yeah, so sure. as we're trying to feed the serotonin and feel better because we're loathing or we're going through some shame spiral, doesn't it make so much sense to be just like, yeah, I'm just going to compound this. Like when you look at the liver, the emotions behind the liver are anger and resentment. So when you have anger and resentment, what's the first thing some people do is they go and drink, right? So it's the feeding of the liver. It's the feeding of the stom stomach. It's the emotional ties behind what is actually going on. Your body's literally speaking to you. And so it's, it's I think it's just fascinating. Um, but the first, the first step in all of this is recognizing the programming that goes into each and every one of us, no matter how good of parents, this isn't a blame game. And I tell that to my clients all the time. We are not right. looking to blame our parents because they were flawed. They were this, the school, the, what it doesn't matter. We are where we're at now. Let's recognize it, recognize it, how it's affected us, recognize how it's affected our decisions, the way we feel about ourselves, the way we feel about the world. I just had a conversation with someone yesterday and I was talking about like, even if our moms, and like we were this felt kid, right? And the mom says, gosh, look at that fat person over there. Look at him eating that hamburger. Even though mom is not saying it to us, we are still getting the program that fat is bad, that eating a hamburger is bad. So we absorb the program and the message, even when it's not being told to us. And I think women honestly get a lot of this programming about sex and sexuality in the exact same way. She's a slut or she's a, you know, or he's a that, or if you do this. Or, and so even though our parents might not be talking to us, we are still getting the program that being a sexual woman is a negative. Being overweight is bad. And, and so as we go through puberty and I don't know if you have kids, but my kids have always gone out and up and out and up. You know what I mean? Like they eat and eat and eat and then they spring up. And so like during those out periods of normal growth, how do you think that's affecting that kid's self-esteem when they have no, they're eating right, they're in 22 sports, but they're still getting a little, you know, hips. And so the self-hatred, my mom has programmed me to think that any sort of extra weight on my body is a bad. And so all of this program, so we need to go back and we need to look and go, yeah, that program is not working for me anymore. I choose to love myself and I'm done destroying myself because of, I don't need to rebel against my mom anymore. I don't need to rebel against society. I'm doing this for me. We hear about it all the time, right? When someone does a weight loss program or even goes to rehab because of a spouse, because of a child, because of society, it never works, right? You have to do it for you. And that is why, because you're just continuing the programming and you're working with society's program of X, Y, Z. You have to do it because you want to do it because that comes from inside of you. And now you're ready to break out of the program and figure out, okay, what is actually going on here? When I have weight loss clients that are going out into social settings and I said, how is that going to work this weekend with such and such event? Are you going to prep your own food? Are you going to eat ahead of time? What are you going to do? And they're like, sometimes I tell people that I'm doing a diet. And I said, why don't you just tell them that I'm eating really clean and I feel great and yeah. add that on the end because everybody else is like, oh, for you, you're not eating fattening like we are and that's sad yeah. but you have to say and I feel great and you have to own your decisions of whatever it is if you if you're ready to be strong and bold and take those brave steps and not just you know hey I'm doing a weight loss program I can't be social for three months no because it's a lifespan yeah own how you feel and say I'm doing this because 
I have joint pain, not maybe you don't need to lose weight, but claim why you need to do it yeah. and own your feelings. And other people learn so much from that of your brave decisions. Just like you said, before we got on is like, you're affecting thousands of people when you tell a story to one person and they yep. tell it again and retell it. So your message is so powerful and so important. And um, we're about to go to another break. So tell us one more great thing about um, Meredith. Well, also, I just wanted to pop in too. And just, you know, we're seeing that with alcohol right now. Like if you don't drink, is it like, are you an alcoholic? Why don't you drink? Because there is a big movement moving away from alcohol. And you're like kind of the odd, like, why aren't you drinking? What's going on? And I have people around me that I know that they deal with the shame of not drinking. And so we're seeing definitely a shift with the younger folks and even with some of the like people our age of like, I just don't want to. And people want to understand why are you like this? Why aren't you like me? You're making me feel like I'm drinking too much. And so just know your independence can make other people super uncomfortable and you might lose friends, family or whatever. And that's even more of a reason you have to put on your own shoes. You have to know who you are and you have to own that so much because your independence can make other people very, very uncomfortable. God, I love you. You are so empowering. You are, you are just, and you make people pull out a victim which is a key thing that I'm like, victimhood never served anybody. Mm -mm. Let's take responsibility. Let's look at what you can change because you cannot control or change anybody else. And you just like, you are great at that. <laughs> you are just right on it. I, I have a t-shirt that says, if I'm too much, go find less because I'm not going to change. Oh my God. <laughs> It's so perfect because it's like, I know I'm a lot for a lot of people. Well, I'm not going to dilute myself to make you comfortable. Yeah. You're going to learn something by it. And I do a lot of brave changes and moves all the time. Yeah. And it's all good. Okay. So we need to go to a break. <laughs> Chatty Kathy. Yeah. Um, and when we come back, um, we're going to talk about a book that you absolutely loved, Changed Your Life, mm -hmm. um, Attachment Disorder. So we can't wait to hear about that. We'll be back in just a few short minutes. I'm Steph, and this is Camille with No More Rules, and thanks for coming back and listening to more of us with Meredith. We're going to talk about a book that Meredith recently read, and I was listening to three, I think her last three podcasts were about this, and I was super intrigued, and just from listening to you over the past year, and you're like, this book has profoundly, I think were your words, profoundly changed your life. And I'm like, oh my gosh, everything I've learned from you and listened over the past months. And then I hear this. And so I'm totally just diving in. And I'm like, so tell us more about this amazing book and what this journey and how it's changed what you're doing. Well, th yeah. Thank and thank you for letting me talk on this because in 50 years, this is the most important book that I have ever read in my entire life. And it has transformed my life um, with every single encounter I have with humans and myself and family, and it has literally changed my life. Um, the book's called Adult Children of Emotionally Immature Parents, How to Heal from Distant Rejecting or Self-Involved Parents by Lindsay Gibson. I guess there's a couple books out there that could have that title. So just make sure it's by Lindsay Gibson. Also, I bought the large print. So my kids wanted to know why I was reading a third grade book. And I really do advise getting the large print because the information is overwhelming and it allows you to kind of relax into it. So basically in this um, book, what she's talking about is something that was uh, started being researched in the 60s. So this isn't necessarily a new concept, but it's definitely been added to, right? Um, and what we're talking about here is anxious, anxious or avoidant attachment. And so when you see someone that has uh, avoidant attachment, um, what they're going to do is this is a person and they say they can see this in infants as young as six months old. So it's a bit of nature and it's a bit of nurture. Um, and that's also goes with um, externalizers and internalizers. And that doesn't mean you're extroverted or introverted. It's the way that you deal with the world and the way that you interact with the world. So just to kind of uh, give you a bird's eye view of what, um, what an avoidant attachment person is, is 
They're not going to talk about things that are intimate. Um, they're going to retreat under duress. They're going to um, handle things on their own. They're going to, I love this, wage a war in their head. So I wage a war in my head that my friends and family know nothing about. I keep everything to myself. I am completely internalizing everything around me. Um, and the way that this shows up is non being non-confrontational, being a people pleaser, um, and and uh, you know never wanting to rock the apple cart. Cart. Whereas externalizers, um, what they do is they are constantly and and I'm also an internalizer, so I feel that I have to handle everything on my own. I am responsible for handling all of my stressors. Whereas an externalizer blames the whole world um, on the whole world. It's the world's fault they dropped their water. It's the world's fault um, that they don't have a job. It's the world's fault that they're fat um, or you know an alcoholic or whatever. They never internalize anything. And an internalizer, like I said, it blames the, everything on themselves. So the goal is to kind of meet in the middle, right? Because all of this is on a spectrum. And for an internalizer like myself, which I would assume both of you are, like basically if you're listening to this right now, you are an internalizer because you are constantly on the search to fix yourself and understand the world around you, whereas externalizers have no time permanent. So you should get over what they just did and they don't understand why you're still holding a grudge. Um, they feel that um, their behavior is perfectly okay and it's just because you're too sensitive that there is a problem. Um, and so it, you can see this balance between externalizers and internalizers and how this creates um, codependent relationships. And um, when it comes to someone that is avoidant, basically you are always like, like even though my friend's acting like a jerk, I need to fix it internally. I need to deal with it. I need to just turn the other cheek and be the bigger person. Because you never believe that to go outside of yourself and tell that person, hey, you really hurt my feelings, you do not believe that that is a possibility. And so you can see how just kind of moving away from being avoidant towards being um, uh, more uh, aligned with, with mental health and all of this stuff is a very positive thing. And like I was just talking to a client this morning and we were talking about her son and she's like, he spilled his water bottle and he blamed me and he blamed the road. And I said, the best thing to ask an, an externalizer is what's your part in this? Because it brings them back into their body. It brings them back into not being a victim of the outside world and take accountability. So this book for me has changed my way that I parent with my kids because when you're an internalizer, and again, if you're listening to this, there's a good chance that you are. Because you are dealing with the entire weight of the world, of everybody, your spouse, your kids, social, you know, the social environment of the planet, your job, you have a very short bandwidth because your energy in your body is always at like a thousand. And so then your kid comes over while you're dealing with all of the planet that you are not talking about. You're not working through it. You're not having anyone or asking for help. And they say, can I have a peanut butter sandwich? And you're like, get it yourself. Da -da 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 -da. Like you have no more. And, and all you want to do is just your kid brings you up. Hey, the, the, the friends at school are being mean to me. It'll be fine. You see, like you're just trying to shut it down. You're constantly yeah. trying to fix external problems because you can't take one more freaking thing today yeah. because you are just a powder keg inside of you and you never lean on anybody. You never ask for help. And this is the number one self-nurturing or lack of self-nurturing. Guess where that's found? Breast cancer. Oh, sure. That makes sense. The emotion of the breast is nurturing and self-nurturing. And so who doesn't ask for help? the super women moms. Yeah. And we just keep compounding that energy in our body and we keep trying to fix things. And so the thing of it is, is as we start leaning, the other day I was laying on the couch and this, this in my head, this constant, but do, 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 fixing all the problems and what's going on today. And I, I could feel it. My heart's starting to race. I could feel myself. And I said to my husband, I'm like, I'm dealing with this right now. Can you help me with it now? If you're an internalizer, 
who does not ask for help, who is avoidant with anything, you know, emotional, this is a big thing to say, I need help working through this because we can handle everything. We're the smartest person in the room. Right. And he sat up and he walked through the three things and it was like, holy shit, that was easy. How did that just happen? I felt better. My heart relaxed. The energy evacuated my body. The situation was handled. And he's like, yeah, we'll just make a call tomorrow and I can help you with that and blah, 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 blah. And I felt it was like, it was like the biggest gift I'd ever given myself. And I had been withholding that from myself for 50 years because I was always responsible for handling my own shit. Yeah. Always. I'm in a relationship like that now that I finally feel like I can walk in and be like, just cry and let it out. And like, well, let's look at this. How can I help you? And like Camille and I work really well with each other. We know when each other needs help. What can I help you with? What can help I unload? We talk about things. I was upset about something with my daughter the other day. And I said, I need your help. Put this in perspective for me. And she did. And I'm like, it just, otherwise, otherwise it would have just been like, I'm losing my mind. She's upset. I have to fix it. No, it just takes you back. So it's like, if anyone can learn anything is like, if something's not right, ask for help, ask for help of if it's physical help, like I need you to help me move this couch. That's the easy stuff. But we all try to do it on our own. Yes. Stop it. Because we're not on this planet alone. But see, when we, when, when we grow up in a space where it's not safe to be vulnerable, okay, yeah. we start to lean on ourselves because voicing a problem, voicing a need ends in something negative. Go ask your dad or no, or you're grounded or whatever the unsafe response to our wants, needs, and desires. We learn from a young age, it's not okay to need something. It's yeah. not acceptable. And in Camille's case, when she was married to a rather extreme narcissist, that she had everything she did was an act all day long yeah. to n- not be in trouble. Oh, Meredith, they did a spec scan on my brain where they looked at it. And, you know, the initial diagnosis was bipolar disorder. And then they go in and they do a spec scan on my brain. And I meet up with the doctor two days later and he sits me down and he goes, is there something you need to tell me you haven't told me? And I go, no, I'm here for help. And I had left my husband. It was one month after I left wow. my husband. And he said, you have the most extreme PTSD I've ever seen in my life. You shouldn't be able to walk in here with the amount of pain I see. You shouldn't have been able to have any memories, mm-hmm. cognition, area 24, which was in like my risk of suicide. How in the world are you alive? Because that's lit up. Like, who would it, but when you're walking on pins and needles all the time, you just don't think but nothing about me was okay. So I was always putting on that mask or that act constantly. So now you can see why I'm so appreciative of having a husband that just be you. That's all I want. Yeah. And it's almost jarring. You're like, are you sure? Like every day yeah. you're like, are you sure? Like, like this is, a, this is amazing. And, you know, I think that the biggest the biggest thing is like being coming together as women coming together as a society. I think social media is a huge part in this Um, YouTube and the way we talk now about mental health and getting help and asking for help and seeing other people get help, seeing other people, having language to discuss, Oh, you're avoiding attachment. And so that makes perfectly good sense why you ghost your friends if anything bad happens, because you can't have a conversation because conversations never went well as a child. Right. Oh my God, what? You know, like this is just who you are based on your programming. And it takes, it's like, this isn't you. This is the personality that you've acquired. And I think that is really super huge. Like that was your personality at the time. That's not who you are. But we think that we're so, we're so in the program. We're so in the matrix, if you will, of what we're dealing with in this state of survival. We think, well, this is who I am. No, it's not. We just need to get rid of this unsafe environment and pull all of it back so that you can be you again. Again, you are, and your healing is about undoing. You were born perfect, right? Think about yourself when you were three years old. 
you were like footloose and fancy free, but we acquire all of the garbage that we need to release and say, yeah, you put that shit on me, but it has nothing to do with me. It never had anything to do with me. This was your trauma, you know, being afraid of bridges, being afraid of storms, being afraid of travel. That is someone else's trauma that they are trying to put on you. And basically parents usually parent from a space of fear. And so it makes sense that they're constantly putting off their fears on us to keep us safe because they don't want us to die. But in the interim, it creates a lot of, a lot of damage. Well, as an internalizer, let's just spit the yeah. commercial. As an internalizer, um, I think one of the most impactful things some one of my coaches taught me was, Camille, other people's behaviors have nothing to do with you and everything to do with them. Yep. Right? Because we're so in that matrix that we think everybody perceives and sees this world exactly as we are, that I'm constantly telling people who come in and they're butt hurt about something somebody did or they want to change them, that it's like people's behaviors have nothing to do with you and everything to do with them. If you're working from a place of pure and good intentions, I'm probably going to let you own whatever your reaction to me is. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, think about it. It's survival again, right? Your mom makes a face, your dad makes a face and you're like, oh, oh, uh, should I go to my room? Survival, survival, keep safe. And so we're constantly reading the room. So we think everyone's facial expression, everyone's eye roll, everyone's tone is because of us, because we were trained as children that it was. Because that facial yeah. expression led to a spanking, led to being grounded, whatever it is. So- it's kind of like we have to pay attention to those types of things because everything is about us. Because if not, I will not survive. Yeah. What would happen? This would be so interesting if everybody just truly showed up and how they are. And I think it's getting closer. It would look like a drag show or um, an LGBTQ uh, pride parade. I was parade. waiting. I knew you would have a great response. Yeah. <laughs> it would look like a pride I parade. I want to be this. Or one of the little girls that my daughter's nannies for, she has this sassy walk that she learned in dance school. And I'm like, too bad we all can't have a sassy walk, that that's just who we are. I kind of do. But I'm just speaking kind of, of which, okay, so, um, and I, so, you know, I'm admiring the world and getting tickled with the world now that I've lightened up a little bit and everything doesn't have to be serious. But I'm going to lunch and I park um, in front, or I have to stop at a stoplight in front of a school so the kids can walk across. And it was the most beautiful observation that you've got like a fifth grader, probably a third grader, two adults, but you've got this little girl who's probably kindergarten or first grade. And there's those little white chalk blocks, you know, so people know where to walk. And everybody's just walking straight across and she's jumping over each little, and I'm like, she hasn't lost that play. She hasn't lost that adventure. She hasn't been programmed enough to know that you don't do that. You just walk across, let's go. We've got things to do, the cross guard. You know what I'm saying? That I observe yeah. that and I'm like, to get that back it's okay to play it's we like, need to it's, teach people that but it's like when like an adult puts on a tutu for a race or like an event oh. you know like a woman puts on a tutu think of the energy of something as simple as putting a tutu on how that changes your energy or pigtails think about those little tiny energy shifts that harkens you back to that younger person energy where you can be free Right. So we're told by way of dress and behavior and language. If you go, I talk about this quite a bit, um, the difference between being nice and being kind. And we are trained, especially as white women, to be nice. It is 101 handbook of women. And we are very upset if someone takes us other than she is a nice person. And being nice usually means succumbing to social norms and the patriarchy. And so you are going to act in a certain way so that you are seen in a certain way, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're being honest, truthful to yourself, being your whole person. If you go to England and you know, nothing against England, I enjoyed that it's very quiet. And I think a lot of us who come from these waspy backgrounds, we tend to be programmed to be nice, good girls. We look at girls in uh, elementary school and they've shown it time and time. Again, they sit, they they color. We like that. Boys are rambunctious. We give them ADD medicine. We don't like that. 
And so what you are, if you do or don't make people around you and adults around you comfortable or uncomfortable is going to be how quickly your sparkle fades. And so being, you know, from the WASPy area, you know, England and uh, those, those countries, it is valued to be nice, to be demure, to sit in the corner and color and um, being loud, you know, uh, outspoken and speaking your truth and wearing a tutu is, you know, like, oh my God, look at her nails. Like, what is she doing with her hair? Why is it purple? Like we love to suppress that inner person that lives inside. Like I said, if everyone was themselves, we, it would be a pride parade because that's truly how I see humanity. When we remove the ego, when we remove the judgment. And, and so like, how do you step into that? Well, for me, a couple of years ago, after I had breast cancer, I shaved my head into a Mohawk. Like I was like, you know what? I didn't lose my hair because I didn't have chemo, but I'm still going to embody what that would have been like, even though it's my choice, which is very different than losing your hair. It's very different than losing um, due to chemo. But I really wanted to like kind of honor that walk and say, you know what, screw it. And breast cancer really did teach me to ask for help. It taught me to be my own person, that there might be no tomorrow and to really take advantage. And since then I've gotten my nose pierced. I've got a couple extra tattoos. I go on lots of trips with my daughter and my husband because I know tomorrow is not promised. And that's what breast cancer taught me because every day that I went through it, although it sucked, I kept telling myself, there's a reason for this. Learn something, freaking learn something from this. Otherwise it's a waste. Be yes. an active participant. And so I became a very active participant through my cancer to become something that was obviously missing in my life. And since that day, I've, I've got 1.3 million followers on social media. I've started a podcast. I wrote a book. I've been to India. I've been to Bali. I've been all over the world because I'm like, tomorrow's not promised. P.S. Cut the mohawk. Get the tattoo. Do the thing. Do the thing. Wear the tattoo. You know, wear the wear the sparkly stuff because that's really where what your body and your your experience is begging you for. I love that because there's so many times whenever I'm going through something tough, I'm like, what am I supposed to learn here? Yep. What's the world trying to tell me? And if I don't learn it this time, what's going to happen again? And I'm like, wake up, Steph. What is in your face? What's mm -hmm. going on here? How are you going to get through this and not? not get through it easy, learn something yeah. and be better and be stronger and go, I can do anything. Like so much stuff has happened to us in the last three weeks with the change of our business and moving and all of these things. And I looked at Camille one time when we were going through it, it started, I said, this is going to be tough. And she goes, it's all going to turn out great. And it has because everything goes great because we're constantly learning and figuring out mm -hmm. how can we pivot and how can I support you? Yeah. Well, and yeah. don't you think Meredith just talking about, you know, doing all the things because I'm um, an internalizer too, that you just take so, so much weight off your shoulders that you can like, honestly, I feel I'm not quite where you are, but I'm going to get there, girl. <laughs> um, but I just feel so much less weight on me. I feel this sense of freedom that people are like, are you really that happy all the time? I truly am. Yeah. But we need that duality. We need that shit in our life to understand the beauty when it gets there. Um, so I'm grateful for all of it. But it just, it's great to see how empowering this has been for, for you. But don't you think it's a lot like a sense of freedom that you didn't have for so many years? It's literally, a, I'm a completely different person. Like I look back to, we were talking about our 20s. Um, when we started the, before we started the show today. And I look back to how low my self-esteem was, how much destructive behavior, the drinking, the guys, um, just low, low self-esteem. And anytime, like I got a tattoo on my inside of my ankle when I was 21 and I worked in car, the car business. And anytime, like I tried to be more in line with myself when I got the tattoo on my ankle, all the men at the dealership, and I was 19, they all put a black magic marker and put a cross on the inside of their ankle to make fun of me. Like they just wanted to shut you down. Like any time, like, and you need to, we need to recognize when a man or the society is trying to shut and make small our boys don't cry, be a man. 
You know, yeah. don't be silly, settle down, like quit acting like an idiot. Like we need to start recognize the language and the behavior of suppression on children and on women by way of making fun of making small and trying to diminish diminish other people and and be there for them and rec recognize the behavior and the language. Okay, so um, unfortunately we can't talk anymore, but <laughs> I want you to real quick because you are incredible. I want you to share how people can get a hold of you. You know your podcast, give all your info out because I'm sure there's people who are like, okay, I want to know more about Meredith. Share what what you can with people. Awesome. So my website is Meredith Willits. I'm sure you guys have some sort of show notes maybe that you can yeah. put there. Um, MeredithWillits.com. I'm on TikTok, Meredith with a Y, W-H-Y. Um, and uh, Instagram, Meredith underscore Willits. I also have a book, uh, Mindset Mastermind, uh, 10, 10 Steps to Change Your Life Forever by Meredith Willits. It's a blue um, front. It's on Amazon, $14.99. It's also available on um Kindle. So that's, I think for free for most people. And my podcast is also Meredith with a Y everywhere where you find podcasts. And I also do coaching. So if you're interested in what I'm talking about and I resonate with you, uh, coaching might be for you. I only have a few more spaces left to be honest with you because I'm kind of booked. Um, but, uh, I would love to connect with each and every one of you. So follow me around on social media or podcasts and I'll see you there. This has been an amazing episode yes. of No More Rules. And I think that's what it comes down to is like, dye your hair purple, be crazy, be you. And women, start complimenting everyone for their individuality because everyone's going to shine. And like we said, be seen through that. Um, this has been great. And thanks again for fantastic. joining us, Meredith. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Thank you Camille. I, I'm so honored to be here. And I hope that your audience gets a lot out of this. So Thanks for having me and maybe I'll come back and we can talk about some more stuff. I'd be here for Let's it. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. Thank you for joining us today. Talk Have a to great you day. next time. Thank you for listening to No More Rules, the impact of being you no matter what. Tune in live the first and third Monday of every month at 8 a.m. Pacific on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Join the movement to awaken your inner power and be the creator of your own healthy life with hosts Steph Yost and Camille Barreto, where clean eating is at the core of our inner growth by honoring our body and health. They help shift perceptions, encourage thinking outside the box, and overcoming limiting behaviors and beliefs. You are worthy of living your best life, developing your inner power with clean eating and a healthy lifestyle, discovering your awesomeness. To find out more about Steph and Camille's wellness and weight loss coaching, visit yourimpactwellness.com today and schedule a consultation. 